Welcome back, it's Robert McFarlane here, and today we're going to be talking about how male directors treat female-led stories. Queen's Gambit, Tomb Raider, Atomic Blonde, are just some of many, many female-led stories that have been coming out in more recent years. I do think that it is brilliant that we've been seeing more stories with female protagonists leading the stories, even more recently with Wonder Woman as well. However, unfortunately, the majority of these films have been directed with the male perspective. And I'm gonna avoid the fact that, yes, most of these films are directed by white male directors. And yes, I am a white male, I, I realise this, and even I actually directed a short film recently called Immune, which was a female-led story. This doesn't necessarily mean that men and women cannot direct each other's genders in terms of the protagonist of the story. However, it does mean that we, as the directors and as the filmmakers, need to take more time to understand that character's gender and how they would perceive the events around them. This episode is about representation and more specifically we're looking at what is known by Laura Mulvey as the male gaze. For those of you who don't know Laura Mulvey, she is a film theorist. She still does a lot to do with film and she came out with one of the most defining theories of the 20th century. In 1975, she released a paper which talked about the male gaze and how in which cinema at that point only seemed to serve men or the male gaze. What was interesting here is it didn't just talk about the fact that film served men, it also talked about how women would also change the way they perceived content to a male gaze as well. So ultimately, we started to realize that not only was content very misogynistic and from the male perspective, it also revealed that we as viewers, as an audience, accepted this very one-sided perspective. Now, after that point, filmmakers and directors and producers started to become more aware of this, and films and stories have started to change over time, especially in the last 10 years. There have been many more films have been written with a female lead, but this doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have the male gaze attached. Now, if you look at films like Tomb Raider, now the earlier films with Angelina Jolie, I think we can all agree had a very overtly sexualized version of the character. Now, was this in tandem with the games at the time? I think so. And then the more recent version of Tomb Raider was a far less sexualized version of the character and actually tried to buck those tropes very interesting and also very, very important that we start to actually consider how we represent gender in our films. Don't worry, don't run for the hills just yet. I'm not necessarily saying that only women can direct female stories or male directors can write male stories. But what I am talking about is us becoming more aware of how we present one another in the stories that we tell. So where has this come from? Well, I recently watched The Queen's Gambit on Netflix and... Men are gonna come along and wanna teach you things. To be honest, it was really fun. It was really interesting. It reinvigorated my and many others' interest in chess, um, which you wouldn't consider was that sexy, but the series really made it very interesting to watch, very compelling, a great story, and an interesting character journey. However, after watching the series, my wife and I sat down, we spotted some conversations happening online about the series, and it was very interesting. It revealed to me just how much the male gaze is still influencing our watching habits now, and also whether we even question what we're seeing. So we're not necessarily saying that the audience needs to be ultra aware of all the content that they put out there, but we as directors and filmmakers do need to be aware of how our content can actually change society itself. 
So during The Queen's Gambit, we watch a very young girl become obsessed with the game of chess and become a young prodigy and end up, spoiler alert, becoming very, very, very good at it. Now I won't spoil the end, but it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> The series dealt with some very interesting and topical issues even now. Even though the series is set in the 60s, we do witness a female going into a male-dominated game where she is seen as lesser and is seen as a shock when she starts to beat the men at their own game. What's interesting here is the derision and the way in which the men see the character doesn't seem to affect her as much as the substance abuse. So the series also tackles addiction as well, which is an interesting topic. But what I want to talk about is how it presents the female character throughout her journey. Now, as we witness her go down into the depths of substance abuse and addiction, <laughs> we start to really get an idea of how the director has actually chosen to represent the character. Now, one scene specifically comes to mind where she is actually at the bottom of the hole. She is using alcohol and drugs regularly. She's actually risking her love of chess. However, as people have actually pointed out online, this isn't just a matter of, okay, she has a drug addiction, but let's look at how she's been represented on screen. I'm your Venus, I'm your fire. If this is her at her lowest point, many people and many women have pointed out how unrealistic this is. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that we always have to be 100% realistic, but if we are trying to explore the person's mentality and current mental state, how much research we do into what that person should look and feel like at that point in their life is really quite important. So, as you see in this situation, she's walking around scantily clad, okay, from the male perspective, that doesn't ring any major alarm bells. But if we remove ourselves from that and we start to think about what society was like back then, as well as what society is now, and we ask ourselves the question from the female perspective and the male perspective, what would we really look like in this situation? What would the home look like in this situation? Many comments online have stated that this really is how someone would look in their best moment rather than their worst moment. So the representation of the female lead in this series is somewhat obscured by a particular perspective. And this is where we bring it back to the male gaze. We're seeing her scantily clad. Yeah, baby, she's got it. Why are we seeing her scantily clad? We need to ask ourselves, what is this adding to the story? Are we just trying to titillate our audience? And if so, why? Why are we still trying to do that in this day and age? And how much does it really add to the quality of the content? By the time we actually get presented with this imagery in the series, we're about halfway through. So we haven't actually had to try and keep the audience there. They are already sold on the character or they're not. They've made a decision whether they're going to commit to this story or not. And that is something that's incredibly important to remember as well. If someone is there for your series, they're for your journey, they will have made a decision about whether your characters are worth watching or not within the first 10 minutes of watching the series. So with that in mind, what other content have we watched over the last 40 years that have actually used again the male perspective on characters that is just not needed? It's been well documented that the princess characters within Disney films in Aladdin, you've got the princess there who is actually taken one step further, not just form-fitting dresses, but she even shows off her cleavage and flat stomach. This can be incredibly destructive to women in general. These aesthetic ideals are just impossible to match. So if we're witnessing a character in The Queen's Gambit who's meant to be at her lowest point but still looks so glamorous and beautiful, we 
automatically say to women, even if you are in the lowest point in your life, you are still meant to look this good. Can you see how this doesn't just add a unfair pressure on the women, but it also doesn't add anything to the storyline. And if you're not adding to the story, then you are spending time and effort on something that just isn't necessary. What's amazing here is this conversation is happening. This is not just being accepted anymore. And so we as directors and filmmakers need to be incredibly aware of how we're presenting characters. Don't just use the sexualization of women in your films to try and get more people to watch it. Instead, ensure the quality of your content is there first and also motivate how we see characters. Stories will take your characters into erotic moments and story elements. Making love in a film can be an incredibly intimate and pleasurable thing for your audience to see as a catharsis. But don't just use the sexualization of a woman in any moment that you can put it there for the sake of getting more eyeballs. Thank you for joining me today. If you agree or disagree with what I just said about female and male representation in film, hit me up in the comments. I'd love to have a chat with you and find some links below to help you up your game on your next film.